welcome to Compass Community Church. Why don't you stand and join us in worship this morning?
Pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. because I am sending you. Go and help my people find freedom and redemption. Go, Moses. And then there's Jeremiah, the prophet. He's young, he's inexperienced, he's afraid. And God says, go, Jeremiah, I'm with you. And then there's Elijah, Esther, Ezekiel, Ruth, and many others who heard the call of God to go, and they went. And then the final words of Jesus to his disciples before he ascended into heaven go. I've heard it said that you can be comfortable or courageous, but you can't be bold. That's true for Abraham, true for Moses, true for Jeremiah, true for you, and true for me. See, in the Bible, there are comforting words like forgiveness, freedom, and redemption, and adoption. But in the Bible, there are also commanding words like repent, believe, follow, and go. Maybe that's the words you need to hear today, to go. Go across the room, across the hall, go across the street, go across the campus, go across the city, the nation, go across the world, go. It's important for us to remember that this isn't just a command to go, this is an opportunity, an opportunity to bless and to bring hope and to be salt and to shine light in dark places and to give to others what was first given to us. You see, we don't just go because that's what good Christians do. We go because 2,000 years ago, God looked down on a broken and hopeless and hurting world and he looked on with compassion. And then he looked at his son, his one and only son, the one and only person who could do anything about it. And he looked at him and he said, go. And he did lived, and he died, and he rose, and now he reigns, and now we go, because he did it first. He moved from heaven to earth so that we could move from comfort to courage, and so that's my prayer for you. Not just that you would move to a new city with a new zip code, but that you would move from comfort to courage, that we would all move from complacency to urgency, my prayer for you is that the most beautiful thing in the world to you would not be cars, clothes, and careers, but the gospel of Jesus Christ, to know him and to make him known. And my prayer for you is that today you would put your yes on the table and you would leave it there to go wherever and whenever God leads you to go. And so I can't promise that it'll always be exciting. I can't promise it'll always be easy. Can't promise it'll always make sense, but I can promise you this, it will always be worth it.
Kids now are dismissed for our Compass Kids program, and also our offerings this morning are for the Church and Ministry Shares and Thrive Safe Church Ministry. There will be a deacon at the back of the church to help you uh, if you need so. Let's come and bow before our God. Our Father in heaven, with praise and thanksgiving, we come together this morning to worship and glorify you. You have invited us to gather here this morning and we have accepted your invitation, whether it's online or here in person. Lord, we long to meet you, to spend this time in communion with you and others who seek you. Give us a rich measure of your grace and blessing. Keep this church and churches around the world strong and add to it. Destroy the devil's work and every force that revolts against you until your kingdom is complete and perfect. We pray for the victims of violence in the many places of war on this earth and in our neighborhoods and sometimes even in our homes. Lord, you deplore violence and oppression and may we always be agents of your peace, whether we see that need. May we always see what you see and may our hearts break for what breaks yours. We thank you for the hope of resurrection that through the ashes we may see and experience new life, a life with hope and a positive future. Help us always to know that you are our God, our loving Heavenly Father, and help us to carry out the work that you call us to do. We pray for those in our church family who have struggles with their health, especially this morning we remember Bev and Ann who are in hospital. Will you surround them with your love and peace? We give you thanks for families, children, and grandchildren who support aging parents. Give them strength and patience. Be near, we pray, to all in their declining years as they struggle with various ailments that limit their abilities to do what they once did. We thank you that in all stages of life, we can experience your goodness and that we can still pray and be a blessing to others. We give you thanks, Lord, for Pete's 95 years of life. We thank you for his many years of faithful servants to his family, church, and community. We thank you for his witness of your love and strength through difficulties and through joys. 
As we celebrate together on Friday, may it be a time of joy and laughter, truly a gift from you. We pray for Joanne and Collingwood too as she is declining in health. Even though she is far away from us, she is still part of our church family bond. Will you surround her with love and peace as her family supports and cares for her? We pray, Lord, for those who have suffered painful loss. Continue to strengthen Pastor Tony in the loss of his dear brother and for Andy and Josephine in the loss of their son. Your resurrection conquered death, and we know that our loved ones are safely and joyfully in your presence. May the hope and promise of a new and eternal life with you give hope and comfort when sorrow overwhelms us. We pray for those in prison who are searching for you. We thank you for the many chaplains all over Canada who faithfully minister to the lost and lonely in the darkness of their lives. We ask for a blessing on the committees and Bible study and prayer groups that meet faithfully. Lord, you have given Compass Church many gifted people, and we praise you for that wonderful provision. Help us to always follow the Holy Spirit's leading as we strive to be obedient and faithful servants. May this church be a beacon of hope and light in, the, in this part of Strathroy, and may all search for you and find you here. We thank you for each person who enjoyed the newcomer's lunch last Sunday. May we continue to grow as we explore faith together. Bless Pastor Peter in his work among us and give him a time of rest, refreshment, and family time. As we listen to your word this morning, bless Mr. Rakama, and may we all truly experience and imagine what it was like to be with the disciples on the mountaintop as Jesus gave them a command to spread the good news when he left them to go back to his father when he had finished his work here on earth. Help us, Lord, to direct all our living, what we think, say, and do, so that your name is glorified in this coming week and always. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus, knowing that you hear us always. Amen. That was a near disaster. I've had more than one of those in my life, so. Hi, I'm Jerry Rokuma, and I'm uh, honored to be here this morning. And we have a whole bunch of feedback, I hear. Uh, the video pretty well did my sermon, and I thought I could go home, but um, <laughs> probably not. So Jesus has gathered his 11 disciples on the mountainside in Galilee, and we're going to read two versions of what happened there um, right now. And then the 11 disciples, this is Matthew 28. And then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority on heaven and on earth, in heaven and on earth, has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And then a more uh, drawn out version of this takes place in the first chapter of Acts. This is Luke writing to a friend of his, a Roman uh, authority by the name of Theophilus. In my former book, Luke, or Theophilus, I wrote about all the things Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, 
while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid them from their sight. Imagine for a moment that you were one of Jesus' disciples. Imagine being back there. Here we are two days past or two weeks past Easter. And, and think about if you had been a disciple, what your last couple of weeks had been like. And go back to, to the Passover. They had come to Jerusalem. They had celebrated the Passover feast together, what we call the Last Supper now. And, and they had done what good Jewish men do. And, and then they had gone to the Garden of Gethsemane with him because that was not uncommon for them to do with him, to go somewhere quiet and pray. And then everything fell apart. And then a mob came and arrested him. And then he was tried. And then he was convicted. And then he was sentenced to death. And he was crucified. And you saw that. You saw him hanging on the cross. You saw him, his body, him being declared dead and his, and his body taken down. And, and you knew that, that Nicodemus and Joseph... Oh, don't worry. Well, that's great. Now I know that I didn't fail anybody. Okay. So back to it. So you were there, right? You saw him crucified, dead, and buried. And, and when you woke up 2,000 years ago, on this day, two weeks after his crucifixion, you were shattered. Your dreams had been blown to pieces. You had spent three years of your life with this man. And now he was dead. You had, you had believed the promises of the Old Testament, of the scriptures, that he was the anointed one, the Messiah, that he was going to set all things right. And now he was dead. And then you went to gather with the other disciples, and, and some of the ladies, some of the women of the group came, and they said, but he's alive. And you, like all the other disciples, went, nah, you doubted it. You said to yourself, this is delusional, this is the ain't, say it ain't so moment. But it was. And here, two weeks later, you're sitting across a fire from him. And he's eating a piece of bread and munching on some fried fish with you. And as verse 3 says in Acts 1, he gave once again a convincing proof 
that he was alive. And he stayed with them for 40 years after his resurrection, or 40 days after his resurrection. And every time they saw him, the reality of the resurrection, the reality of the victory over death became more and more clear. And then he took them to that familiar mountainside in Galilee, not so far from where it had all begun. And then, again, I want you to pretend you were there. Because one of them will ask, and maybe it was you, they asked the question that that was burning in their head. And the question actually can be boiled down to two words. What's next? I always feel sorry for ministers on the Sunday after Easter. Because what do you say next? And, and they had that question, what's next? And, and in their worldview, the Jewish narrative of 2,000 years, what was supposed to be next was that Jesus was going to get rid of the Romans, was that Jesus would, would establish the kingdom. And so one of them asks, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Because that's what they thought was life ever after. That's what they thought was perfect. And, and he says three things by way of answer. And the first is, is, he doesn't even answer the question. He doesn't address the question. He says, I want you to go back to Jerusalem. And I want you to stay together. And I won't do anything until the Holy Spirit comes. My father is going to pour out our spirit on you. And then, and then you're going to be baptized. Not, not with water like John the Baptist, but, but with the Holy Spirit, and that's a whole different thing. And then, in relation to your question, I don't know when the kingdom's going to be completed. That's not for you to know. But the thing you should know is that the Holy Spirit will empower you in ways that you can't possibly imagine right now. So go, wait, and see. And then he says this, and when the Spirit comes, you will understand, and you will be my witnesses. In other words, my spokespersons, my ambassadors, in the city, Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, the nation, and then to the ends of the earth, the whole world. And as the video said, he puts it in a command in the Matthew passage. He says, I want you to go out there into the world and tell everybody about me. And I want you to make more disciples. And I want you to teach them everything that I taught you. And I want you to always remember that I will be with you until the very end of the age. And so now we're going to skip ahead a bit. We're two weeks past Easter, and we're a few weeks away from the ascension. But when he said those words, the very next thing he did was very unexpected. He left. And imagine that. You're sitting there, and he's, you're listening to him, and all of a sudden... There he goes. And you're thinking, where, where is he going? What's going on? What do we do now? Well, what they did was they followed instructions. They went back to the city. And they kept meeting. And, and I want you to, to, again, imagine you were there and look around you. For three years, everywhere you went with Jesus, there was a massive crowd. And now it's about 100, 120 people. There's those 11 disciples. Young men, possibly 20, no older than that. Disciples usually, became, people usually became disciples when they were 13 or 14. And they usually were in, with their rabbi for anywhere from three to five years. So, so let's say they were 18, 19, 20. Middle-aged, by the way, in those days. 
Peter might have been a little older. Matthew, the tax collector, not exactly a good job in that part of the world. He was a traitor. He worked for the Romans. He was probably older. The others, we never know their occupation. Five to seven of them were fishermen. They were largely uneducated. They had no oratorical skills yet. They had no great vision other than the one Jesus had given them. And then there were the women, a solid core that had been with them from almost the beginning. There was Mary, the mother of Jesus. And then there was another Mary who had been a prostitute from whom um, demons had been cast. And then there were some other women who were mentioned in a couple other places, and some of them had a lot of money, and they paid some of the bills. What I'm trying to portray is that it was not exactly a group of people that would strike the fear in the hearts of the local leaders. In fact, the local leaders figured that they had pretty well put this Jesus thing to rest. He was dead. Those guys would vanish into the woodwork, go back to fishing in Galilee. And the, and, and the Romans themselves, like, like nobody in, in Rome, Christianity wasn't even on a radar back then. What they are or what they were then, and if you were one of them, was a bunch of nobodies. And then came Pentecost. And then came that baptism Jesus promised by the Holy Spirit. And then they followed instructions again. Even they didn't know how the instructions would work out. And within 300 years, the gospel message would capture the Roman world and would change history. And if you read the rest of the book of Acts, you will see the power of the gospel how this ragtag group of people introduced all sorts of people to Jesus Christ and then taught them to replicate the process over and over and over again. But sit in that room with them on that Sunday morning of Pentecost and imagine the mission. How could they succeed? How would any church succeed? What is Compass trying to do? And the answer comes in two parts, and Jesus provides the first part himself. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. You see, the Holy Spirit empowered them. The Holy Spirit empowers us. The Holy Spirit enabled them, and the Holy Spirit will enable us. And again, I want you to imagine this for a minute, that you were there. Imagine being a disciple, and you're walking in the streets of Jerusalem, and your very shadow heals people that are sick. Imagine being there the day Peter told a man who had never walked in his life to get up and go home, and he did. And, and consider as you as you. Read on in Acts the power of the Holy Spirit and the faith that they had. And, and then the local leaders in Jerusalem woke up and said, Whoa, this isn't going away. These people aren't going back to Galilee. This is getting bigger, this Jesus thing. And, and a few decades later, people in Rome went, What's going on? There's a movement out there, this this. this this, this way, this thing they call the way, this Jesus movement, and, and he's God and not Caesar, and, and they tried to stop it, and they all failed. You see, they believed in the power of the Holy Spirit, and they also believed, they also worked it all out through faith. They had faith. They had faith in the power of the resurrection. They had faith in the power of the Holy Spirit leading them. And in that faith, there is a point to be made this morning. You see, on the face of it, if you look back then, those 11 
semi-educated young men, had a mission impossible. But the Holy Spirit made it possible. And, and they had no experience in mission work. They had no organizational skill. They weren't particularly good at relationship building. They spoke mostly Aramaic, which was not the language of the Roman Empire or their world. It was Greek. So they sort of had to wing it. They sort of had to take risks. And they sort of had to trust the Holy Spirit would lead them. And they he did. And, and they started with a small vision. And every day the Holy Spirit made it a little bigger. And the mission got a little bigger. And it got better. And, and they took one of Jesus' most famous parables, the parable of the seeds, and, and they just became seed throwers. They, they just told everybody and anyone they wanted to in all sorts of places about the gospel. They just threw the seed down, and they trusted that the Holy Spirit would water it. And almost always that started fires. Peter started the first fire on Pentecost Day when, when he gave a speech that persuaded 3,000 people that Jesus was their Messiah. And sometimes the fires had, had unintended, we would say sometimes, bad results. Like a few months later, Stephen had a speech that incited the local leadership that got him killed and that started the first great persecution of the church, ironically led by a man who would become the world's greatest missionary to this very day. But the silver lining of that persecution is all those disciples were spread out all over Judea and Samaria, as Jesus had, had predicted, and they spread the gospel there. They were the witnesses of Jesus there. And then when it got bigger, they went all over the Roman Empire. And they kept lighting fires. And the church grew. And it continued to grow to this day. One of the things about the gospel that we read in Acts is, and, and I've always believed it to be somewhat of, of, a distra of a detraction, is that when you read the Bible, it's a two-dimensional thing. It's words on paper that go to your eyes and your, and your, your, your own imagination. And so when we read it, we just take it in as matter of fact, and, and it's actually way more than that. It's real people doing real things. And as the video said, it's not easy. It wasn't easy for Paul. Now, let's look at Paul for just a minute. I mean, take away the fact that he was imprisoned, whipped, tortured, um, flogged many times, shipwrecked, and all these other things. Bad as they were, eventually he was beheaded. Um, but let's just look at Paul when things were, quote, going good. Do you think it was easy for him then? It wasn't. It was awkward. It was risky. He was laughed at regularly. Seriously. He was... So he goes to Athens, for example, and he's, and he's meeting with all these other wise guys who the Bible says... Um, did nothing but talk, but we know that they're the Greek philosophers and they're, they meet regularly and, he, and they're listening to him. And, and they're interested. And then he says, and then this Jesus rose from the grave. And they went, wait, what? Did, did he just say that that man walked out of a grave? Oh, he's been drinking the Kool-Aid. That, oh, that, like, that's, uh, then they started laughing. And that happens to people all the time. That happens to Christians all the time. That happened to Paul all the time. He was marginalized. He was persecuted. And that's what happens. That was, that's opposition because Satan knows that this is the real deal. And yet he carried on. And yet all those disciples carried on. And they, they carried on because they believed. They believed in the promise of Jesus Christ. And they believed that he, when he, him when he said, I will be with you always. 
and they were captured by the notion of grace. By this notion, by God's great love, by, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that you could be freed from your sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace, that great, great characteristic of Christianity that makes it better and different than all religions. And they became the greatest hope peddlers and grace givers in the history of humanity. It's discipleship. And, and if you read on, you'll know they weren't proud. You know they worked together. They linked arms with everyone who said they believed in Jesus Christ. And they broke taboos and all sorts of social barriers. They were a bunch of Jewish guys who had been raised to believe that the foreigners, the Gentiles, were all a bunch of pagans and you should have nothing to do with them. And you had your own special diet, your own way of living, and stay that way. And, and they broke all those rules. And, and, then, and then for the sake of Jesus, they went to different countries and different nationalities. And they weren't snobs. They weren't intellectual elitists. And they didn't become a bunch of wealthy barons who disregarded other people. Quite the opposite, they cared for the poor. They cared for those who could not help themselves. They took in the outcast, and they were more than willing to talk to strangers because, because their passion, their overriding desire, was to introduce Jesus Christ to somebody else. And what they did over the years, the centuries, and the generations is they built the body of Christ the church. Not buildings like this, but the body of Christ, a living, breathing organism that tells the world, that goes, as the video says, that goes and tells the world. And think of it for a minute. The success of the Christian gospel is unparalleled in history. This morning, across the world, 2.2 billion people will worship God. And here we are, a couple weeks past Easter, a small percentage of that 2.2 billion. And in many ways, my friends, we're exactly the same as those 11 disciples, that little motley crew of 100 people, that gathered a couple weeks past Easter. We have been equipped with the exact same Spirit of God as they were. We have been baptized by that Spirit. And the mission of Jesus Christ is no different today. The words of Matthew 28 are still the same. Go out there and tell people about me. Teach them everything I taught you, and do it fearlessly because I am with you. That is the mission of any church. That's what this compass thing is all about. All of us, from time to time, have to answer this question. Why are you a Christian? And I'm sure that some of us have similar stories, but I'm sure that if I asked 50 of you, I'd get 50 different little versions of things. But there's actually one common answer for every single one who calls themselves a follower of Jesus Christ. And that is this. Somebody told me, You see, somebody told me, that would be my, my parents. I probably heard the name Jesus the first time in my life when I wasn't even realizing it in, in the form of some little Dutch lullaby. But somebody told us about Jesus of Nazareth, born in this backwater Roman province 2,000 years ago called Judea. And somebody told us that this Jesus grew up to become the most influential human being in all of history. 
And we believed it. And somebody told us that Jesus, by himself, sacrificed himself, despite the fact that he was completely innocent, sacrificed himself for all our sins, for all our faults, and all our frailties. And then he did an even more extraordinary thing. He walked out of a grave two days later. Somebody told us that, and we believed it. And in that faith, he gives us hope. He gives us a purpose. He gives us, his spirit enables us to live beyond ourselves, to truly love God and our neighbors in genuine ways. And somebody told us, that one day he's coming back. That one day we're going to see him face to face. That one day that kingdom they asked him about on that hill in Galilee will be complete. It will be restored. But it'll be way bigger than they thought. It'll be universal. You've heard this before. Somebody told you. And now is the time to tell somebody else. Is it going to be risky? Yes. Is it going to be easy? No. Is it, is it going to be awkward? Sometimes. Probably. Is it going to be worth it? Well... Is it going to be worth it? I got to tell you, folks, there will be nothing more worthwhile in all our living that we could do than to introduce even one person to life in Jesus Christ. There is nothing that we could do that would be more worthy than to introduce someone to the family of God. Not just for today or next week, but forever. That's worth it. So, so let's do what we say we want to do. Let's go. Let's talk the gospel. You do that with words, but you also do that with character. You also do that in the way you live and work and play. You will be my witnesses, he says. God help us as we do just that. Pray with me, please. Father God, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for your love for this world in Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Jesus, that you left your spirit. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will empower and enable our hearts to serve you in everything we do, everything we say, for your sake and God's glory. Amen. Thank you.
Just a couple of thoughts on our way out into the, the rest of our living. Sometimes people say into the world, and I always say it's our Father's world. It's here, it's there, it's everywhere, it's our Father's world. Jesus says in, in the Matthew passage, he says, um, And surely I am always with you to the very end of the age. And Christians too often just... When, they, when you read that passage in Matthew, you think about going out and making disciples, which is, is the function of the church. But that he is always with us is, has to be the underlying confidence we live with and in. And the Apostle Paul puts it the best in Romans chapter 8. And he talks about, um, he asks this famous question. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Because that's what God so loved the world is all about, is the love of Jesus Christ. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or whatever problems you can think of in our contemporary world? And the answer is no. Because in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So my sisters and brothers, my friends, go into your living in whatever it is you do with the grace of God the Father, the love of Jesus, the Son, our Savior, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit who lives in your hearts. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.